And something's fucked up. Lock it. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to get started. Physics X. Physics X. Can you come here at Theory? He just took off. Bye. Well, it's funny because Jeff Jeff was the advisor of record for both of my master students. So like he's the advisor of record on these two master's theses, which he doesn't understand at all, and he'll freely admit. Like, but uh, so he's kind of the local expert in a sense. He can come in and check all this out. He's the local advisor of experts. So. Um, I, I realize, man, I, there's so much to talk about. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But so I, I started to, to try and get to one place, and then I was like, wow, I don't actually have to go there. I can cheat and do it a different way. But um, anyway, so uh, we're, we're still doing strings, by the way. And honestly, like, we could do a physics X for two years and never finish strings. It's crazy how much there is. Um, so last time uh, we left off with me uh, being frozen by having been asked basically the same question twice, <laughs> but uh, and I didn't have a good answer. Um, and so uh, do so the the first question we can ask is do classical symmetries uh, need to survive quantization? And uh, the answer is uh, sometimes. <laughs> that's, the, that's the answer. <laughs> so there are different kinds of symmetries um, that we encounter in, in, in physical theories. Um, and for, for the most part, classically at least, they can all be written as some uh, symmetry of the Lagrangian, or more appropriately, as at least one person in this room should point out, Brad. What? They are symmetries of the action. And uh, they just say, uh, if I do some transformation to the, the things that the action is built out of, then I ostensibly get a different action. But if that is in some sense related to the original action, um, uh, or if the Lagrangian is related to the original Lagrangian up to a divergence term, then we would call that a symmetry. Now, symmetries can be broken down into roughly two categories. Um, and this is actually something that I'm currently learning a lot about, along with Brad and my formal senior design students. Um, but normally we can take symmetries of the action, and I apologize, you weren't here last time, so this is all gonna be like, that's right. What's that, Flournoy? Um, we, can, <laughs> we can break them up into what we often call local symmetries and global symmetries, where uh, global symmetries are the kinds of transformations we do and we do it the same everywhere throughout space-time, whereas local symmetries, on the other hand, are transformations where the actual transformation parameter is a function of where you are, so you can do it differently at different positions, hence the name local. Um, and then there's loco. I'm just kidding, there's not loco. Uh, so uh, often, and, and I've taught particle physics uh, to this effect, often um, these are what are referred to as gauge symmetries, and these are what are sometimes referred to as physical symmetries. Um, and the word gauge here is obviously to pique your familiarity with gauge transformations and electromagnetism and other contexts. And in fact, when I talked about the symmetries of the standard model forces, uh, and I gave you the groups, SU3, SU2, SU, uh, U1, and we talked about grand unification and all that stuff, I was referring to gauge symmetries. Um, physical symmetries, well, so, so these gauge symmetries before the world, physical symmetries. Gauge symmetries are actually a really interesting topic on their own because um, a gauge symmetry is really nothing more than a redundancy of our description of the physical theory. They're not true physical symmetries uh, in the sense that these are. Uh, they're literally just sort of a crutch for us to be able to write a theory and work with it explicitly with calculations but we, in, we end up having to introduce these, these structures that aren't actually physical, and so the gauge invariance of the theory kind of guarantees that the theory ultimately doesn't depend on these artificial constructions. So a good example of this is when we use coordinates, right? We introduce coordinates to do physics, 
so that we can write things down explicitly, okay? But coordinates aren't physical, like they don't live out there. So the true physical description that you use should, at the end of the day, be coordinate invariant. So you can think of coordinate invariance as a sort of gauge symmetry that you've been seeing since physics one, okay? Physical symmetries, on the other hand, are a different beast. Physical symmetries are actually physical manipulations of the states of the theory. So for example, rotational invariance, like we, you know, we can set up an experiment where we throw in some particles and we measure what comes out and then we can take the experiment and we can rotate it and we can ask, does the outcome of the experiment actually change? So these are not redundancies, they're actual physical transformations that you can do on the theory. And you can have invariance of your theory under either of these. Um, where it gets a little subtle, and this is the thing that I'm learning now with my senior design students, is that these pairings aren't necessarily uh, strict. You can have local symmetry transformations which actually correspond to physical symmetries and, um, and vice versa. So, but I'm not gonna get into how you go about uh, discerning the difference and making those identifications. The key for our discussion, as per last time, is that these, these transformations, if you have them in a classical theory and then you quantize the theory, if these transformations break, it's, it's okay. You, just, you have a physical, you have a, a quantum version of the theory that just happens to not have these symmetries, okay? On the other hand, gauge symmetries in a classical theory must be preserved in the quantum theory, okay? And one of the ways that you, there's a couple of different ways that you can think about it, but one of the ways that you can think about it is these are, these are basically symmetries associated with non-physical things. And you don't want something that's non-physical in your classical theory to suddenly become physical in your quantum theory, okay? And so the, the, the sort of canonical example of this is we know in electromagnetism that the photon does not have a longitudinal polarization. It's only transversely polarized, and that is intimately tied to the gauge invariance of electromagnetism. If you quantize the theory and you somehow break this gauge invariance, then suddenly the, the, the photon is going to pick up this non-physical uh, longitudinal polarization, which happens to be a negative norm state, and you get a lot of wonkiness in the theory. So, um, so what, last time we were talking about the, the, the symmetries of the world sheet theory, in string theory, and we talked about the two-dimensional diffeomorphism invariance and the vial invariance, and then there was also the Poincaré invariance acting on the index of the X mu fields. Um, and when we looked at the quantum version of the theory, these two survived intact, and then this guy ended up being uh, proportional to something we call C, which is the central charge of the theory, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about today. Um, and the reason I got confused Sometimes knowing too much is dangerous. Um, the reason I got confused is these two symmetries are associated with the gravitational part of the world sheet theory. Remember, these were coordinate transformations, and uh, this is this position-dependent rescaling of the metric of the world sheet theory. And the problem is that I knew in advance that two-dimensional gravity, that is one plus one-dimensional gravity on the world sheet, has no local degrees of freedom. Okay, it's actually a topological theory. And so I was wanting to associate these symmetries with global symmetries of the world sheet theory, but these are in fact gauge symmetries of the world sheet theory. Okay, so they're, they're actually of this uh, gauge form which have to be preserved in the quantum theory in order to preserve its consistency. Um, it just so happens to be the case that these particular gauge symmetries end up uh, being associated with uh, a non uh, with an absence of local degrees of freedom, they only have you only have uh, global states in this one plus one dimensional gravitational theory. Um, okay, so that was all to wrap up last time, and now what I want to do is I want to talk about kind of continuing in this vein, we're going to talk a little bit more about this world sheet theory. And a lot of what I'm going to say isn't going to hang too desperately on what we talked about last time, some of the, some of the features of what we talked about last time, but I'm not going to write down those actions again or anything like that. Um, 
I just kind of want to give you an idea of how some stuff happens because I know many of you have heard things about string theory and you might you might be curious like where does that number come from why does it have that feature why does it have that this feature so let's see if we can look at uh, where some of these things come from okay so um, let's imagine that we have a string which is moving through space-time so as we talked about last time you know this is the string itself but as it moves through space-time it, it sweeps out what we call a world sheet and um, Clearly, as this thing moves through space-time, it can oscillate. Um, but there's two sort of directions. Uh, so space-time is, you know, space-time has got, you know, some uh, three and then dot, 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 dot. So there's extra space-time dimensions up to some total space-time dimension D. And as this thing moves through space-time, you can imagine that it, it can, of course, wiggle. Okay, that's the, the nice property of this thing being a surface. A lot of people like to say it vibrates or whatever. Pick your poison, I don't care. But if we think about it, um, if we, if we want to think about the wiggling of this surface, there's um, a direction, there's a couple of directions in which we don't want to associate the wiggling with being physical. Okay, so let's just take an instance of the string maybe right there. And then um, if, we, if we really just looked at the wiggling in sort of the simplest sort of normal mode manner where we just think about the endpoints as fixed and then this is just a bunch of standing waves, then we can really just consider all the different lowest order standing wave modes. And we can ask ourselves how many directions can those standing wave modes wiggle in? And the answer is how many independent directions? So I'm going to give you a string, and you're going to stretch it between your fingers, and then someone's going to come along and pluck it, and it's going to wiggle in the fundamental mode. And in this room right now, how many independent directions can that wiggling occur in? Two. Right? So independent, like I can just pick two orthogonal directions. Yeah. And it can wiggle this way, or it can wiggle this way. Any other thing is a linear combination of those two. Okay. All right. So what we find is that the string should be able to wiggle in d minus one dimensions, okay? But we get an extra circumstance because this picture is being drawn in space-time, and so we should all also consider that we don't want the string to, so notice when I said normal modes of the string between my fingers, no one mentioned this direction, which they shouldn't. But then we also want to be careful when we're considering a string because neither do we want oscillations in this direction, but we also don't want oscillations along the world sheet. Okay, so that, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of the way I've drawn it, actually. Okay, because the, the surface in space-time is the world sheet. So it's like an oscillation along the world sheet is... is dynamical behavior of the thing with respect to itself, which when you think about this in space-time, it just doesn't make sense. Remember, an oscillating string, when you draw its world sheet, the world sheet contains those oscillations. So I would ask you, you know, draw a string which is oscillating along its world sheet. Well, you just draw that and you'd be done. Like there's no, there's no wiggly bumps to draw. It's just oscillating in this direction. So the physical states of the string have to be reduced to oscillations which are transverse to the string, and so that reduces us to uh, d minus 2 total oscillation directions. But when we want to quantize the theory, um, trying to get rid of two directions in which things can happen is going to break the Poincaré invariance of the theory. Remember, Poincaré invariance is the symmetry associated with doing things to that space-time index. And if you're somehow picking out two directions of space-time where you're not letting things happen, then that's not, um, that's not going to let you preserve this uh, Poincaré invariance or the Lorentz invariance of the theory. It says basically the statement that all space-time directions are on equal footing. Okay, you're somehow, you're, you're breaking that symmetry. 
So there's a couple of ways that you can proceed when you quantize the theory. You can either say that I'm going to preserve this, or I'm going to allow this to be broken. And so what we can do is we can just take two coordinates, say x0, x1, and then take the rest of them, where this goes from uh, 3 or 2 to d minus 2. And we can line up our world sheet so that it is extended in exactly these two coordinates. And then we work explicitly with these transverse coordinates. And this, is, this program is called light cone quantization. And when you do light cone quantization, and it was sort of one of the first uh, procedures used to quantize strings, and this is not the way that I'm going to talk about it. Uh, but when you do light cone quantization, uh, one of the things that you have to do at the end of the story is remember that the theory in space-time is actually a d-dimensional theory that has this d-dimensional Lorentz invariance. And so, for example, um, when you are finding the spectrum of the string in space-time, you find this field, uh, which is, um, which is, well, I'm not going to go into the details of it because this is not the way that I want to do it, but you essentially find a, a vector field and you're counting its polarization states and you find that the number of polarization states of the vector field is uh, d minus 2. But from things that people who took particle physics know, if you have a, a vector and you're counting its polarization states and its independent polarization states are d minus 2, then that means that it corresponds to a transverse vector field which is necessarily massless. And so that massless condition in this particular context is where you arrive at that condition that D has to be 26 or whatever. Okay? We're actually going to do it in a little bit different way that's a little more general. Um, but anyway, so light cone quantization is one of the earlier methods and if you actually read resources on string theory, you'll read about light cone quantization um, I don't like it because I like to pr preserve symmetries, and so explicitly preserve symmetries. So you can ask, well, how do you do this preserving the symmetries? And this is where it gets kind of cool, and Brad should pay attention because he's going to have to report this back to his non-senior design partners. So one way to, um, to preserve this symmetry is to act, is to use uh, the full set of X mu fields, okay? So we're going to have some world sheet action that's built, uh, you know, and I wrote the Lagrangians last time, but it's going to be built out of this full set of X mu fields with this full symmetry. But what you have to do is, there's two ways to look at it. One way to look at it is to say, there's an overcounting here. You're including field configurations that have oscillations along the non-physical directions. So you can literally take this thing and you can divide by the volume, and, and actually we should be doing this in a path integral, but I'm just going to write it this way because I'm being pretty sloppy anyway. We're going to divide by the volume of a gauge slice. I mean, actually, so we should be doing a path integral, so let's do this. Uh, integral over all fields. And so we've got the world sheet scalars, the world sheet metric, and then that's the world sheet action. So we can divide by the volume of a gauge slice. That is, uh, when, we, when we sum over all field configurations, we're including field configurations that are non-physical, so we just divide them out. Now there's a very nice story uh, in quantum field theory about how you formally do this. And it turns out that if you write this, this particular division factor in the right way, then this actually becomes this actually becomes itself an exponential term, which you can just combine with this exponential term to create a new action. And what's cool about it is the new action is the old action written in terms of these X mu fields plus a couple of new fields. And these are what are called the Fadiv Popov ghost fields. So what, what happens, and it's a really, really nice story, um, is that you basically work with the full theory 
where you have these non-physical oscillations, but you get these additional fields whose oscillations actually act to cancel off the non-physical contributions from your original action. So these are often called the friendly ghost fields. Now, the, we don't have to dig into the details of this. This is just going to play a critical story in what I'm about to talk about in the context of putting string theories together. Um, but the idea is essentially we have in our original starting point something that's non-physical. One way to deal with the non-physicality is to allow things to fluctuate in the non-physical directions and to add in these ghost fields which cancel off the non-physical oscillations. And this is not a story specific to string theory. Like you can, you can do the Fadiv Popov quantization program in ordinary gauge theory. In fact, you do it you know, for electro and electrodynamics when you go to, to quantum field theory and do QED. Although, depending on who teaches the course, they might or might not do it that way. Some people do Gupta Bliller and there's other options. Okay, so um, the, the key observation here though is the following. I have D space-time dimensions, so there are how many of these fields? D, right? There are D of them. But I only have to include ghost fields that cancel off two oscillations. So this number is associated with the dimensionality of the string. And that doesn't care how many dimensions the string lives in. The, string is two, the string's world sheet is two-dimensional. So the number of ghost fields is kind of fixed, okay? And that's gonna be an important observation in just a couple of minutes. Okay, so we have to this point, uh, so, and, and I'll just go ahead and tell you this. Um, so far, we have our X mu fields that we've added to the world sheet. And, I mean, I should say we have the, the world sheet metric, but uh, that's not going to play as sensitive a role because, again, uh, we can use the symmetries to set it to the trivial metric, uh, but it's also a non-dynamical theory in two dimensions, so it's not going to play the same role as the rest of the fields we put on the world sheet. Uh, but anyway, we have these X mu fields. We have the ghosts that we have to add in to cancel off these oscillations, and for lack of imagination, those are what are called the BC ghost fields. Um, and they have, by the way, certain properties that you can deduce from you know, this, this program, and we're not gonna need to go into the details of it. Um, what kind of fields are these on the world sheet? Do you remember from last time? Internal. They're in, they're, they're, they live on the world sheet. So we're talking about a two-dimensional space-time and we're putting fields on it. So we're doing two-dimensional field theory. So on the world sheet, what kind of fields are these? Space-time. So when I ask what kinds of fields you have in a field theory, typically I'm talking about their various quantum numbers. So I want to know about their spin, I want to know about their charge, I want to know about their mass. Uh, right now, I'm really just talking about their spin. Each room's just a scalar field. Right? These are scalar yeah. fields, right? So these are world sheet scalars. Okay. Um, and it might not come as a surprise to you, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but these are world sheet scalars. They have a space-time vector index. So it doesn't really matter how much you beat on this theory as it stands. If this is all you start with, you're never going to get fermions in space-time. It's just not going to happen. Okay? I mean, you're, you're basically, you're, every, all your starting points are bosonic. And one of the fundamental things we know from quantum mechanics is that if I give you a bunch of integer spins, that's all you're going to get. Right? You can't combine integer spins to get half integer spin. So what we'd like to do is we would like to extend this story by including some fermions. And so, uh, in order to add fermions to the story, um, we introduce things that look like that, where these are world sheet fermions. Now, you might have noticed something interesting. These world sheet fermions carry space-time vector indices.
So if you think that it was confusing because these are world sheet scalars and space-time vectors, it's even worse here. <laughs> because these are spinners in one space, they're fermionic in one space, but they're bosonic in the other. Okay. Now, you might say, well, why would we, why would we put a space-time index on that world sheet fermion field? And remember, at this point, that space-time index is just an internal gauge index from the world sheet perspective. So th these, are, these are internal degrees of freedom from the perspective of the world sheet. So we're doing this two-dimensional world sheet theory. Um, and the reason for that is because for reasons which we will not be able to go into, it is valuable to uh, endow your theory with what is called world sheet supersymmetry. And that is uh, the standard story of supersymmetry is that if you're writing down a supersymmetric field theory, for every bosonic field in your field theory, you have to have a corresponding fermionic field. So these are bosonic, they're spin zero, these are fermionic. So we're, we're, we've got both. But the trick is, is that the properties of the bosons and the fermions have to be the same. So if this bosonic field transforms under the internal symmetry according to it being a vector, this also has to transform under the internal symmetry as a vector. Otherwise, there couldn't be a symmetry which interchanges them. So it's, it's the same story in ordinary supersymmetry. Like if you say, what's the super partner of the electron? The electron spin a half. Well, it's an integer spin particle, but it has to have the same electric charge as the electron. It has to transform the same under electromagnetism. Because at the end of the day, supersymmetry is going to be a transformation which interchanges the two and says the resulting theory is invariant. Okay, so that's weird, but um, but we'll we'll just you know take it as a take it as a. Um, but then, because psi has a vector index, we need to go back and we need to worry about this part of the story. Does it make sense to have psi oscillating? Granted, it's a world sheet fermion, but does it make sense to have a psi oscillating along the two directions in which the world sheet is extended? And it turns out the answer is no, and you can completely repeat the story, but the difference is that when you repeat the story for the psi fields, the form of the ghosts that you have to introduce are a little bit different because these are world sheet fermion fields where these were world sheet bosons. And so what we find is for these psi fields, we have to introduce another set of ghost fields called the beta gamma ghosts, which have different properties than the BC ghosts. Okay, so at the end of the day, we have introduced the embedding fields X mu. Now remember, we talked about those last time. Those are the fields that actually let us think about the string as moving in space time where these are ending up giving you the coordinates in space-time of each point on the string. The BC ghost fields come to cancel off the non-physical oscillations here. We added world sheet fermions, and then we had to add in these beta gamma ghosts to cancel off the non-physical oscillations of these additional fermion fields. And now we can start asking, well, what possibilities do we get with these theories? Um, okay, so um, first of all, we should go back and we should, because we're, we're, we're banging on the theory a little bit, we're adding stuff to it, we need to go back and we need to ask about its consistency. In particular, we've got to go back to the Bile anomaly and ask, are we still working in a theory where all of those gauge symmetries from the classical starting point are holding in the quantum version of the theory? And uh, it still holds that the Biel anomaly is proportional to the central charge of the theory. But now, the thing is, is we have additional fields, so we're going to get additional contributions to the central charge of the theory. And again, I haven't defined for you what central charge is. Last time I just kind of wrote down a result. Um, I'm not going to define it for you now, but I'll tell you how to calculate it if you really want. So if you want to get this number, all you have to do is uh, take the action of the theory that you write down, vary it with respect to the world sheet metric 
If you vary the action with respect to the world sheet metric and set that equal to zero, does anybody know what equation of motion you're going to get? Or sorry, what quantity? Sorry, sorry. If you uh, sorry, if you vary the action, I'm sorry. I, I don't want equations of motion. If you vary the action with respect to the world sheet metric, you will produce the energy momentum tensor for the theory. Okay. So we vary the action with respect to the world sheet metric. That's going to generate the energy momentum tensor for the world sheet theory. And then all we have to do is take the operator product expansion of the energy momentum tensor of the world sheet theory with itself and then look at the coefficient of the fourth order pole. And the coefficient of the fourth order pole is half the central charge. So if you want to do that, hit me up. We can go through it. Um, but so, yeah, it's a very technical program here. But the idea is essentially, <laughs> I know, I know. The idea is essentially the vial invariance of the theory, it's a, in a sense a scale invariance. Remember, this was literally a position dependent <laughs> rescaling of the metric. And so the scale invariance of the theory is very sensitive to there being some predefined energy scale on the world sheet theory. Because if you have an energy scale that sort of exists in the world sheet theory, and it might come from zero point energies of fields or whatever, but if you have an energy scale, then suddenly that sets sort of an absolute scale, and then rescaling is not going to be an invariance of the theory. So really, in trying to get this vial anomaly to cancel, you're kind of trying to cook up your theory so that overall there's no sort of fundamental scale in the theory. And that's why you calculate the central charge, which would otherwise be that fundamental scale, and you demand that it vanish. Now, if you do this thing, you, you know, get the energy momentum tensor, OP with itself, fourth order pull, all that stuff, you find some interesting results. For every X mu field, you get a contribution of one to the central charge. Uh, for the B and C ghost fields, you get a contribution of minus 26. For every fermionic field, you get a contribution of one half. And for the beta gamma fields, you get a contribution of, and I never remember these numbers, 11. Okay. Now, it, it, the, these are all free fields on the world sheet. So you can actually calculate their energy momentum tensors separately. And that's why I'm writing down the central charge contribution from each of them separately. And of course, if they were interacting, then you'd have you know, they would influence each other's uh, energy momentum tensors. Um, but now we have in our hot little hands the building blocks of trying to figure out how do we go about getting C equals zero. Okay? So one method which we talked about last time is to only use X mu and, of course, in the language we're using now, the BC fields. And so if we get a central charge contribution of 1 from each x mu field, and our BC contributions are giving us minus 26, then our vial, or our central charge, is proportional to D minus 26, where I have D here because I get 1 from each of these, and so I have D of the x mu fields. And so, of course, this tells us that D is 26, which is kind of where we left off last time. That is, of course, not the interesting result because this is not going to give us fermions. We would like to have fermions in the theory. So if we want to add fermions to the theory, we need to take these into account. And so if we add fermions to the theory, you want to work it out? So how much central charge do I get from these? D. D. From these? Oh, do those not contribute 26 each? No, 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 it's a total of 26. 26. You get minus 26, right? The, the, the BC fields are the BC fields. They're, they're like there, and they don't change when you change other things in the story. As long as you have these X mu fields, you've got the BC fields. Uh, sign you. D over 2. D over 2. And then lastly, the beta gamma fields are 11. 
Now, some of you might have heard of this number, but most of you should have heard of that number. The idea that string theory lives in 10 dimensions is sort of one of the classic uh, results. But we see here that it's not all string theories live in 10 dimensions. This is a perfectly you know, well-defined string theory that happens to live in 26 dimensions. It's just a string theory that doesn't have any fermionic degrees of freedom. This is, of course, called the bosonic string. And it turns out, and this is the same when you, when you study subjects like quantum field theory, when you study something that's really technically uh, large and deep, uh, it's often very valuable to spend a lot of time focusing on the simplest examples before you get into the, the, the bad examples. So when you study field theory, an entire first course in quantum field theory might only talk about scalar fields. Because you kind of learn all the, you know, the tips and tricks of quantizing fields in the scalar field example. And then you go on and you learn about fermionic Dirac fields, or maybe you talk about, uh, you talk about gauge symmetries, and then eventually, what, what are we laughing about? That's exactly what we're doing in Mark's QFD. You're doing scalar field theory? Yeah. Yeah, so, and, and, and then when you start learning about gauge symmetries, a lot of times you focus on the abelian gauge symmetries, you know, because they're hard enough, and then maybe if you're lucky, you get to non-abelian gauge symmetries and all of the complications that they bring in. So studying the bosonic string is a very valuable tool, or it's a very valuable step in learning string theory. And in fact, if you look at Polchinski's two-volume set of string theory textbooks, the entire first volume is nothing but bosonic string theory. But the second volume is the superstring. And the superstring is technically more complicated for a variety of reasons. Um, but it's obviously the one that you have to focus on if you, if you think you're going to connect string theory to the real world, because the real world has fermions in it. Okay, so when people say string theory lives in 10 dimensions, what they're really meaning is that the potentially physically meaningful string theories live in 10 dimensions, okay? So, um, <clears throat> all right. We'll see, okay. All right, so um, we've got the number of dimensions of space-time, and again, like, the, just, just to kind of, what nugget in all of this story is that coming from? It's coming from the fact that you have to add in this fixed number of ghost fields. You leave these things to have variable dimension, and then you just have this condition that something equals zero, and, the, and basically the number of the, the, the tunable number has got to be set to exactly cancel off the contributions from the ghosts. Yeah. So I was just going to order, so then in the 10 dimensional more realistic case of fermions, so those fermions, they're just added back, are they added right from the beginning? Like had a, a, like a, a sort of a Polyakov action? Well, yeah, yeah, side. yeah, they, they get thrown right into the Polyakov action, and they're added to the world sheet theory as, as free Dirac fermions, in the same way that we wrote down the Dirac, the Dirac Lagrangian, the free Dirac Lagrangian for space-time. You add these to the world sheet action with just a Dirac kinetic term. You know, using the equivalent of two-dimensional Dirac gamma matrices, et cetera, et cetera. So, but yeah, you start with all of the fields on the theory at once. But, but it's going to get more interesting. Like, I, I haven't exhausted the possibilities. Because we have yet to talk about this strings topology. So I have happily drawn this kind of... And this is a bit misleading, that's the wiggling of the string. I have, I have happily referred to this string and its little endpoints, but the, uh, the honest thing we have to ask ourselves is, um, what does this string actually look like? And it turns out there are two options. The first is, of course, to let the string have endpoints. And then as it moves through space-time, it sweeps out something that we can kind of think of as a band. But then the other option is, of course, to let the string's two ends meet in which case, as it moves through space-time, it sweeps out something more akin to a, a stretchy cylinder. Okay. Uh, string theorists are not the most imaginative in terms of naming things, so we have open strings and closed strings. Um, and consideration of uh, open and closed strings um, brings in an interesting possibility. Now, first of all, when we're defining the theory we really only have to think about these kinds of pictures sort of infinitely long. 
when I say defining the theory, what I mean is when I'm talking about the content of the theory, like what degrees of freedom I'm putting in. Once I let things interact, the pictures I draw can get really complicated. You know, if I have open, closed strings interacting, then I get these really interesting pictures that do all kinds of wonky things. Okay? They're much more complicated topologies than just these two simple cases, but these topologies come from interactions. I'm just asking what are the states of the string, so I'm just thinking about the simplest possible topologies in each case. Now, there's an important lesson that comes from this once I consider interactions. So let's take this picture. If I take this picture and I consider at any point asking what does the string look like, so at any point in this picture I can draw what the string would look like and I find that at every point, you know, a glimpse of what's going on is that I have closed strings. Okay, and yes, this point right here represents the two closed strings, tips coming together, and they're going to merge and form a single closed string once you get over here, okay? If I consider open strings, on the other hand, I definitely have diagrams like this, okay? But with open strings, I also have this possibility of taking an open string, and then it moves around a circular trajectory and ends where it started. Okay, so this open string is just going to move around in a closed loop. But of course now I see that if I have an open string that forms a loop, there's no reason not to also think of that as a closed string moving this way. So what we find just by this really nice cartoon topology argument is that a theory of closed strings only is consistent. But if I have a theory with open strings, I must include closed strings because they would be produced naturally anyway. Okay, so there is sort of a consistent truncation to a theory with only closed strings, but any theory with open strings must also include these closed strings. And, and although I won't get to this as a, a robust detail, um, or I won't get to this detail, it is robust. Uh, that closed strings are always in the picture, and that's very useful because it turns out that gravity comes from the closed strings. And so the idea that gravity is necessarily part of all string theory uh, is robust, whether you're trying to think about open strings or closed strings. Okay, so um, now here's where it gets cool. If we um, think about, uh, so we're going to forget about open strings for the moment, and we're just going to think about closed strings. Because after all, it's just one thing to focus on instead of two. So if we just think about a closed string theory, then um, we can again use the world sheet symmetries to fix the metric to the diagonal 1, 1 form, in which case the world sheet is literally a perfectly smooth cylinder. So the world sheet topology would just be S1 cross R. And so when we quantize the world sheet theory, we're literally doing two-dimensional quantum field theory on this geometry, okay. which is not vastly different than doing two-dimensional quantum field theory in R2, flat two-dimensional space. You just have the fact that one of the dimensions is periodic. Okay? But that period periodicity gives you some interesting, uh, some interesting um, effects. So it, this is sort of the time direction on the world sheet if you're confused, and we can kind of think of the S1 as the spatial direction. So, um, so what happens is when you do a field theory on a cylinder, it turns out that the, so you, you expand in these Fourier modes, and you can think about modes which move, say, clockwise around the cylinder, and independently you have modes which move counterclockwise around the cylinder. In string theory parlance, we refer to these as right and left movers. Because obviously one of these is left and one of these is right. Okay? Um, but the important thing is, is that these are independent. How? How do you mean? You're on a... You have a one-dimensional space and you have two independent modes, I guess. 
That seems odd. Uh, to me, that's like saying I have a, a number line and going plus and going minus are two independent. Well, things. I mean, if I have a so if I have a um, think about it this way: if I have a if I have a one-dimensional particle that's defined on this space, okay, sure. I can literally take its momentum modes and I can break them into two categories. Momentum which in which the particle's moving clockwise around the circle. Okay. And momentum modes in which the particle's moving counterclockwise around the circle. Okay. Normally we wouldn't separate things like that because you can continuously rotate one direction into another, but you can't do that here. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So um now what's key is that the, 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 the Fourier modes moving around one direction are independent from the Fourier modes moving around the other direction. And so what that means is that when we build our theory, we actually have to make a choice, and it can be done independently, for what goes on the left versus what goes on the right. And this actually gives us some interesting new possibilities. So for example, for our left moving part of the theory, we can take 10 x mu fields, assuming we're living in 10 dimensions. We can take 10 psi mu fields, again, assuming we're living in 10 dimensions. We can take the BC ghosts, well, we have to take the BC ghosts, and we have to take the beta gamma ghosts. Okay, and that can be the left moving part of the theory. And then for the right moving part of the theory, we can do exactly the same. Okay. Um, if you do this, then you get the starting point of what are called the type two slash zero theories. That is, we basically use the same content on the left and we use the same content on the right. And then whether you get type two A, type two B, or, or various uh, versions of type zero theories kind of depends on what you do after the starting point. Now another option obviously is we can take 26 X mu's and the BC ghosts on the left and on the right again take 26 X mu's plus the BC ghosts and that of course gives us the bosonic string theory. Okay. But where it gets interesting is if we take For our left moving modes, basically the starting point of the type two theory, but for our right moving modes, we actually use the content of the bosonic string. Now the way that I wrote that looks a little weird because I wrote 10x mu plus 16 lambda i. And the reason I wrote it that way is this is in principle 26x mu's, but we've only got 10 values of this thing over here. So at the end of the day, 10 of these are going to be associated with directions in space time. They're gonna pair up with these. But that means there's gonna be 16 things left over. And whatever index is on these 16 scalar fields is not going to be a space-time index because space-time is only 10-dimensional. So what happens is that these 16 fields end up in space-time giving you a gauge theory whose gauge index runs over 16 values. So well, let's think, so if we have SU3, how many values does the gauge index run over? Three, three colors. SU2, two. So our gauge index runs over 16 values. This is a very large gauge group. <laughs> 
turns out it's a rank 16 gauge group and you can actually figure out what gauge group it needs to be. You know, one option is, just to give you an idea, is U1 to the 16th. That's a rank 16 gauge group. That's not a very interesting one, it is a billion. But for reasons which we will not be able to get to today that has to do with uh, uh, modular invariance of the theory, um, it turns out that you can only use uh, one of two 16, rank 16 gauge groups. You're either gonna use SO32 or E8 cross E8, where E8 is the exceptional group, which is uh, really hard to define. This is a little bit more easy to define. It's just a 32-dimensional generalization of rotations in three dimensions. These are what are called the heterotic strings, because they're sexy. And what's interesting about the heterotic strings is, again, they live in 10 dimensions. They're 10 dimensional strings, okay? But they come equipped with space time gauge symmetries. Yeah, Nathan? Yeah, I mean, what right do we have exactly to separate left and right and distinguish them in this way? Because they're completely independent from each other. Yeah, but I mean, like, are they not? I, I mean, I don't know. <clears throat> it seems like that would have to, you always have to treat them the same. I mean, they're just two, I mean, yeah, they're independent, but they're just arbitrary directions. It's kind of like the invariance of space time. I mean, like, X and Y are independent, but I mean, you can't, I don't want to treat them differently. That sort of thing. Well, that's the thing. X and Y are independent, but there's a symmetry of space time that rotates them into each other. Yeah. Okay. There's a continuous symmetry of space time. So if I'm moving in the X, I can just do a continuous coordinate transformation that gets me moving in the Y. Okay, here I can't take my coordinate transformation, a continuous coordinate transformation, and interchange right and left movers. That's actually a discrete transformation. Yeah. Well, why can't you use like a mirror or like a parity transformation? Well, that is actually going to be a really important part of the story later on. Um, it's obviously not something that you can do here. But here you can start talking about taking the theory and projecting it onto left-right symmetric states. And that's actually one of the ways that you actually distinguish between whether you end up with the type 2A or the type 2B theory. So you can, look, you can, you're free to demand the symmetry between left and right. What I'm pointing out, though, is that it's not required. Okay? And so you have this additional option for constructing these things. Now, if this doesn't seem like convincing, what's really amazing and if this is something I actually talked about in the spring when I gave the lecture on D-brains, is that when you do the open string theory, when you actually think about how you introduce open strings into the theory, you end up with a consistency condition, which again reproduces these two gauge groups. Exactly. And then it was proven in the late 90s, uh, due to Witten, that this purely closed heterotic string theory is actually non-perturbatively equivalent to the theory with open strings. And so there, there's actually a connection between this theory and the open string theory. You know, albeit this is one where we're, you know, treating the two sides of the string very differently. And in open string theory, it gets even weirder because you've got one-sided strings. So there, there's a... There, I understand why it can be uneasy to do this, <laughs> um, but uh, but it's 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 consistent. Trust me, I promise. Okay, so I just want to get to my last comment um, so that we can get out of here and kind of end on a note that motivates what's going to happen next. Um, so um, so we we can ask ourselves, what do we see when we when we look in space time? Uh, you know, we've got these strings, they're kind of moving by with these little funky world sheets. We know they're closed strings, that's all we're considering right now, so the world sheets are these tubes. And so we can ask ourselves, what, it, what is it that we see in space-time? And it turns out that what you see in space-time um, obviously depends on what you put on your world sheet theory, but it also depends on uh, some additional things we have to think about. So, um, so just to kind of give you a a rough idea of how this story plays out. Um, when you when you want to figure out what you see in space time, there's two things you have to figure out. Okay? And you get it all from this world sheet theory, because this is where you start. This is the way we're defining the theory. 
The first thing, you, you, you obviously quantize this theory, okay? But when you quantize the theory, you're going to find essentially a, a vacuum state. So you're going to find sort of the lowest energy state of your, of your quantum field theory. And then you're generally going to take your Fourier coefficients and promote them to operators using commutation or anti-commutation relations, depending on whether they're bosonic or fermionic. But anyway, you apply those creation operators to the vacuum, and then you build up your tower of states. So this is sort of a thing you physics majors have seen in quantum mechanics through looking at the harmonic oscillator, but it's just directly generalized uh, to quantum field theory. But the key thing you have to figure out is, when you figure out the ground state, what is the energy of the ground state? Because in space-time, that's going to translate into the mass of this thing. How much energy this theory has as it moves by you, you're going to perceive as its mass. And secondly, how does the ground state transform? Okay, does the ground state transform as a scalar, a vector, spinner, or what? And then as you excite the ground state, how do the excitations, how do the excited states, how does their energy change? Or what, or what are the energies of the excited states and how do the excited states transform? So, so this is a program that you carry out when you quantize just any field theory. It's just here you're doing it to a two-dimensional field theory, but all of the results are then taken into the interpretation in space-time for what is the string? How does it appear to me as it goes by me? Okay, what do I actually see? And when you do this, um, what you find is that there's one more choice you have to make before you can finish the story. And that is, um, we have a circle here. So we know things, um, you know, or they, they meet the field values meet themselves as they go around the circle. But you can ask yourself, do I require periodicity or as I go around the circle, anti-periodicity, something more general? Well, for the world sheet embedding fields, since these things are intimately tied to space-time, um, these are going to be required to be periodic as we go around the S1 of the string world sheet. So I'm just parameterizing the S1 by some angle. And so going around the angle 2 pi is going all the way around once. Um, it would be kind of weird if the embedding fields were not periodic because that would mean that I would start here at a point in space-time, and then if I just traced around the string once and got back to the same point, I would be at a different point in space-time, <laughs> which is kind of weird. Okay, the interesting part, though, is that for the spinner fields, spinner fields don't have as intimate an association with where you are in space-time, and so here you actually get a freedom of a sign choice which in, uh, in topology land is called uh, choosing your spin structure. But when making this choice, you basically have two options. There's the positive option, which we call the uh, Ramond option, and the negative option, which for simplicity we call the Nevada-Schwartz option, named after the people who uh, pioneered some of this uh, work. And so, um, so now when we want to think about um, our theory, we have, um, we have, yes, we have a various sectors of our starting theory. So we can take, for example, a theory where all of the, so all of the embedding fields are necessarily periodic. We can take that theory and we can take all the fermionic fields and make them periodic on the left, so on the left we can have Ramon type spinner fields, and then on the right, we again, these have to be periodic, but any spinner fields we could also choose to be periodic, so we would have on the right hand side, we'll do this, uh, no, yeah, okay, so <laughs> if on the left and the right we choose the periodic boundary conditions for the fermions, then we have what is called the Ramon Ramon sector of the theory. If we choose the fermion periodicity to be minus on both sides of the string, then we have the rather lengthy NSNS, Nevada Schwartz, Nevada Schwartz sector of the theory. And then we can mix them. On the left, we can do positive. On the right, we can do negative. And this leads to the RNS and the NSR sectors of the theory, respectively. Now, 
coming back to what I was saying earlier, um, each of these different choices is a different starting point. So I'm, I'm, I'm writing down a quantum field theory on this cylinder. This is one quantum field theory. This is a separate quantum field theory. This is a separate one, and this is a separate one. You can allow all four of these to be part of your string theory, but in quantizing this thing, you have to work with one of these at a time. Okay? Now, if you work with the Ramond fermions, let's see if I can do this. Well, I'm just, I'm just going to kind of cut to the, the summary here because we're out of time. And I want to at least say this. Um, so if we look at the zero modes, these are the ground states of the fields. And we look in the NS and S version of the theory. Okay, so we're going to look at this part. Then what we find is that the ground state of the theory when you have anti-periodic boundary conditions for the fermions, the ground state uh, actually has a negative energy um, and is a space-time scalar. So in space-time, we're combining a scalar and a scalar. Of course, that gives us a space-time scalar. And unfortunately, the total energy of that corresponds to a space-time mass of minus 2 over alpha prime. which is problematic for obvious reasons. If we look at the ramon ramon sector of the theory, that is we take our space-time fermions to have periodic boundary conditions as we go around the S1, then what we find is that the ground state of the Ramon field uh, with these periodic boundary conditions is actually a space-time spinner. So in this version of the theory, we're taking a spinner from the left and a spinner from the right as our ground state. Now in space-time, you don't see the left and the right, you just see the combination of the two. And so you essentially tensor these things together, but when you tensor together two spinners in quantum mechanics, what do you get? So these are half integer spin states and you're gonna tensor them together, what do you get? Bosons. You get bosonic states. And so these end up giving you space-time bosons and in fact they give you a spectrum of p-forms where these are the differential forms that we've talked about a couple of times in physics X. And those happen to have a total energy of zero. So you get a set of massless P-form fields from looking at the ramon ramon sector, okay? Now, <coughs> you don't actually get um, a, a zero mode sector from RNS and NSR. And the reason for that is because the ground state of an NS is got a negative contribution, it's half of this. And the ground state of an R sector is zero, and it turns out you can't combine zero on one side with something that's non-zero on the other. There's a condition called level matching, where however much energy you have on the right has to match the energy on the left. If you don't satisfy the level matching condition, you have this energy which is flowing around the string, which, um, which doesn't make any sense from the perspective of of the world sheet theory. So, um, so the, the only way to actually combine the NS and the R from different sides of the string is to actually excite something. And so um, if we look at excited states, then there is just two that I want to point out to you. One is the NS and S excited states. So that's if we start with this and we actually excite the ground state on each side with one oscillation. And so I'm actually going to write down technically what this looks like. So the untwiddle is the left vacuum, the twiddle is the right vacuum. Here I'm exciting the right vacuum with one oscillator, here I'm exciting the left vacuum with one oscillator. Since these both started with the same ground state energy, they're both getting excited by exactly once. One, one, one creation operator, they're both being raised the same amount, and this ends up bringing me to a total mass squared, which is zero. But I want you to, sorry, I might as well give that a different label. But if you squint your eyes and look at this, there's a mu and there's a nu. 
If you literally squinted your eyes and didn't pay attention to anything except the mu and nu and ask, what is this thing in space time? It's a two index tensor. And I can take any two index tensor and I can decompose it into a scalar, an anti symmetric tensor, and a symmetric tensor. So it's a very minor detail that in the NSNS sector of string theory, at the massless level, you have a spin two symmetric field, or a two index symmetric field. And that's the metric, that's the graviton. And this is where gravity comes out of string theory. One small part of this big immense story. But it's there, and you, it's, it's in every version of string theory. It's even in the bosonic string. Okay? This whole NSR blah 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 formalism you don't need for the bosonic string because you don't have these psi fields. You go back and you work entirely in terms of the X mu story, but it still comes out that there's a spin to excitation at the massless level that corresponds to the graviton. Lastly, if you combine the RNS excitations, where again you have to have an excitation operator on this guy to bring it up to zero so that it can be paired with this guy, I won't write it down. Um, the combination of the RNS fields, or the RNS uh, boundary conditions from the left and right, end up giving you space time fermions. So this is where you get space time fermions in the theory. And then you can keep exciting things and get, and get higher and higher things. In string theory, usually you focus on the massless sector because anything that's non-zero mass is a, a mass of order of the string scale. So it's, it's a ginormous jump from zero. So the low energy content of the theory, which is what we would actually see in this story, is completely contained in this. Now, of course, coming back here, that is a problem. Mathematically, it's a problem. <laughs> m squared being negative uh, just doesn't make sense. And this is, of course, what we call a tachyon. And so what we've discovered, as I indicated last time, is that, naively at least, string theories seem to include a tachyon. And tachyons, you know, for the lowbrow are super sexy going backwards in time, particles that faster, travel faster than the speed of light. From the highbrow, Quantum field theory language, you recognize a tachyon as a statement that you have an instability in your theory. This is the Higgs mechanism. If you sit right there, you're going to find a tachyonic fluctuation in your quantum field theory, which is telling you that you're not going to stay there for long. You're eventually going to migrate. So what this is telling us is that the way we've constructed our string theory is unstable. So what we can do is we can actually take this entire theory and we can ask, is there a consistent projection down to a subset of everything that A, does not include the tachyon, and B, is closed. And what I mean by that is, if I have a big theory with lots of stuff, and I truncate down to a closed subset, that means if I take excitations in here and let them smash into each other and generate things, they never create something that's not a part of this set. It's a closed system. You can't always be guaranteed that you can do that in a physical theory. But it turns out that in string theory, you can do something called the GSO projection. Gliazi, Shirk, Olive. Take the entire story of string theory and project it down to a consistent subset that does not include the tachyon. It gets rid of some other things too, but it gets us to a theory which starts out at m equals zero as the lowest energy level, which of course m equals zero is consistent. Okay? But the upshot of that, and this is my final point, is that when you do that projection, again, you strip out various fields in the theory, you end up with exactly what you need to have space-time supersymmetry in the theory, which is not what we started with. 
When I started this story up here, I said I want world sheet supersymmetry. That is, for these bosonic fields, I want world sheet fermions. And I want them to be interchangeable. That's world sheet supersymmetry. It has nothing directly to do with space-time. Space-time supersymmetry would be exchanging these fermions with these bosons. A very, very different idea. But it turns out that in the effort to remove this tachyon, you get exactly what you need. And the counting is obviously more involved than just pointing to these three lines. But you get exactly what you need in order to have space-time supersymmetry. So at the end of the day, what do we get from this very, very simple assertion that a string becomes an extended object? We got extra dimensions. <coughs> of course, that means we can get the clues of climb mechanism. We make some of those dimensions small, and we get gauge symmetries from clues of climb. We get huge gauge groups. And by huge, I mean there are 246 generators in E8, and there's two copies of E8. Clearly, we get any and all love that you would get from grand unified theories. We get gravity. So clearly, these are theories of everything. And we get Susie. So without really trying to get, these are all ideas which people have sort of toyed around with in terms of just like, let's add this to the standard model. Let's do this and let's see. Every single one of these ideas falls out of string theory without trying, just by looking at its consistency, its mathematical consistency. And to me, that's why I'm so entranced by the subject, whether or not it eventually ends up being the right theory of the universe. All right, so we'll finish there and pick back up next semester, starting with extended season.